Well, as you might expect, since we are worshiping as a, um, as a dispersed congregation this morning, there are certain uh, elements of our worship that we don't have in place. Um, and one of those would be uh, the opportunity to, to worship God through giving. So uh, if you would like to do that and support the ministry of the church, you can do that on our website. There's a Give tab on our, on our main page, and we would invite you to, to do that. Um, let, me, uh, let me say a quick word of prayer for us as we jump back into our study of Exodus chapter 4. God, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, whether we are together or we are um, worshiping you separately, you are the God of all. You are worthy of our praise. Lord, in uh, this very challenging time that we are facing, um, not only as a nation, but uh, globally, um, I pray that uh, Christians, those who, are, who love your Son and are trusting him, that we would have an opportunity to show that it is in these difficult times that there really is a difference. Because we know you, the true and the, the living God. And I pray that you would provide us the help that we need to be able to respond to this uh, this threat and this crisis um, in, a, in a very different way that causes those who don't know you and love you and trust you to sit up and take notice. And I pray that you would help us to, to respond well to your word. Uh, and we pray this in the name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. Adoniram Judson made a very powerful impact uh, on the world. For 38 years, he was a missionary to the nation of Burma, which is today known as uh, Myanmar. He translated the whole Bible into the Burmese language. He created a Burmese dictionary that was used by missionaries who came after him. And as a result of his, uh, his work, uh, today there are four and, a half, uh, four and a half million professing Christians in Myanmar. And uh, of those four and a half million, two and a half million are evangelical Christians. Uh, but initially, Adoniram Judson was a begrudging spokesman for God. And, and since you don't have a bulletin, you don't know, but the, the title of today's message is The Plight of a Begrudging Spokesman, uh, which will be our study in Exodus 4 this morning. Now, Adoniram Judson was raised in, in the last few years of the 1700s and lived until 1850, and he was brought up in a Christian home. His parents' only desire was that Judson would trust Jesus and would serve him uh, with his whole uh, life. Um, Judson was a professing Christian through his childhood up until the time when he attended Brown University when he was 16 years old. Now, Judson was a brilliant person by, by any measure. In fact, his mom taught him how to read in just one week when he was three years old. So, um, understandably, um, he, he attended Brown, but also went early at 16 and graduated in only um, three years. Um, but when he was at Brown, he became very close friends with, uh, with a man by the name of Jacob Eames. Uh, they they um, had a lot in common. They became very close. Uh, but Jacob Eames was a deist, and gradually he influenced uh, Judson. And so by the time Judson graduated, he was no longer a professing Christian. He was a, was a deist. Um, and so Judson was the, uh, the, the valedictorian in his graduating class. And so when he gave um, his speech at commencement, his parents were brokenhearted because they could tell that their son uh, was no longer uh, believing the things that he used to, that he was no longer um, trusting Jesus Christ. And on Adnar Judson's 20th birthday, he announced to his family that he was no longer a Christian. He asked his father for some of his inheritance, and he told them that he was going to New York City to get involved with the, the theater scene. And when he was in New York City, he connected with a group of, of, uh, of actors and playwrights that were a pretty rough bunch. He, he later wrote that those that he ran around with were um, reckless vagabonds. He said he, he found lodgings wherever he could, and he built the landlord whenever he had the opportunity. But God was on his trail. God was on his trail. And in time, two things turned him back uh, to the Lord. Uh, the first was, uh, at one point, he, he went out into the country and he visited a family member. Um, and uh, he said that as a result of that brief visit, he, he met just a, a congenial, very uh, warm um, uncle, I believe it was, 
And um, he said for the first time he, he realized that a, a person can be extraordinarily intelligent but also be a Christian. And so that got him thinking that maybe I can still be a Christian. And after he left this visit with his, uh, with his family member, um, he, he went out on his own by himself, uh, kind of through the countryside, and um, he was looking for a place to stay one night. And he stopped at a little inn, a little country inn. He'd never been in this, um, in this village before. Um, the innkeeper welcomed him in and said, yeah, you, you'd be, be welcome to stay here. He said, but, but just to give you a warning, uh, there's somebody uh, here at the inn in an adjacent room who, who's very sick. He, he's very close to, to death. Um, and so you might be bothered by him throughout the night. And Judson said, well, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, and so as Judson settled in uh, for the night, he, um, he heard the, 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 the gasps and the groans and, and the, just the pain of, of this man who was dying in the adjacent room. And, uh, and it caused Judson to really ponder his own, his own mortality and to ponder questions of life and death. And the next morning, as he went to check out of his room, he, he went to the innkeeper, and he asked the innkeeper, um, and he said, thank you for letting me stay here. Um, can you tell me what, what happened to that man who was in such distress last night? And uh, the innkeeper said to him, uh, oh, he, he, uh, he actually died uh, last night. And Judson said to him, he said, well, well, do you know who he was? And the innkeeper said, yes, I do. He, he was a, a young man who went to Brown. And his name was Jacob Beans. And Judson just sat there in, in this, this, uh, this inn for a couple of hours and was just tormented and, and so fearful for, for his own, his own uh, mortality. And, and that one day he too would die just like his good friend um, Jacob Eames. And um, over time Judson realized that this cannot possibly be a coincidence. Because if, if Jacob Eames was right, and if Judson was right in his deistic beliefs, then everything is just meaningless. And it was just happenstance and a coincidence that his dear friend happened to be dying um, right next to him out at this inn. And Judson's biographer, he, he, he wrote this, that hell should open in that country inn and snatch Jacob Eames, his dearest friend and God, from the next bed simply could not be pure coincidence. And, and that was one of those steps that gradually brought Judson back to the faith so that he could one day go out and serve God. It was the power of God intervening in Adoniram Judson's life that turned his life around. And shortly after that, Judson recommitted himself to Jesus, committed his life to ministry, and then, and then sailed for Burma. And God used him powerfully. And you know what? There are actually great similarities between Adoniram Judson and Moses and you and me. I think if we're, we're honest with ourselves as we study this passage on Exodus in Exodus chapter 4, we'll see that you know that there's a lot of me in, in Moses, a lot of my fearful spirit. We see him uh, living this out in his interaction with God. Now, um, Moses gave us two excuses in, in chapter 3. Right, or really he gave God these two excuses for why he shouldn't be the one to go to Pharaoh, to tell Pharaoh to let the people of God go. And his first two excuses were, but why me? But why me? Why should it be me who goes? And the second excuse that we focused on last week is he said to God, but I don't know your name, right? Who are you? Who am I supposed to tell the Pharaoh and the children of Israel that you are so that they'll know that you really sent me? And now in chapter 4, he's going to give God another three excuses. And God is going to answer all of them. Um, the first excuse is he says, but if I go, they won't really believe that you sent me. And then God gives him an answer. And then he says, oh, okay, but I'm not a good public speaker, right? I'm not eloquent with my, with my words. And God gives him an answer. And then at the very end of chapter 4, he just flat out tells them the truth. and says, but I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And we're going to see that God answers him there as well. And what I want us to see is that God sends us, sends his people out, Moses, Adar, Judson, and you and I. He sends us out on a mission, not only with truth, but also with power. Not only with truth, but also with power. 
So if you will open your Bibles, please, to Exodus chapter 4, and we're going to start looking at verse 1. Please turn there now. Exodus chapter 4. Rustling, so I assume that you're there. Um, let's look at let's look at verse one here. So then Moses answered, "But behold, they will not believe me, or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you." Okay, now let, let's stop there for a second and remember the verse just before this. The Lord had just told Moses that I'm going to use you to lead my people out of Egypt. And you're not going to go empty-handed, right? You're going to get, what do we call it? Back pay, remember? So for all their years, their decades of, 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 serving, of serving Pharaoh for free, um, they would not leave empty-handed. So, so they're, going to, they're going to get um, some back pay. Okay, but here, uh, so that's where the last chapter leaves off. But, but now, um, he, he has this, this next objection. He says, well, but God, if I go to them, they're not going to believe that you sent me. Right? And so what God is going to do now is He's going to respond by, by endowing Moses with divine power. Right? So that, so that these people will, will be convinced that God was the one who sent him. And so God enables Moses to perform three miracles. Alright? The first is starting in verse 2. Turning Moses' staff into a snake. So verse, verse 2 says this. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a, a serpent. A serpent means poisonous, right? So it became a poisonous snake. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. And the Lord continued, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Now, now remember, uh, how long has Moses been in the wilderness for the couple of people here? How long has he been in the wilderness? 40 years. 40 years, that's exactly right. So, so he's been out of the wilderness. No doubt he has, has, um, uh, has had to, to deal with wild beasts and, and snakes and things like that. But evidently, this particular snake is so toxic and poisonous that what does Moses do? He runs away from it, right? He, he, he flees. Um, now, I have never picked up a snake, and in fact, one of, my, um, one of my life goals is to never pick up a snake. But I do know this, that when you pick up a snake, you do not pick it up by the tail, right? You pick it up by the head, I guess, because that's the thing that's going to strike you, okay? Um, and, and, and yet, Moses follows God, so he's willing to kind of do this act of faith, right? Where God says, pick him up, pick him up by the tail, and, and Moses, Moses does now, there's a deeper significance in God telling him to take his staff, throw it down, turn it into a snake, and then it turning back into a staff. And you might remember earlier in our Exodus series, we saw that the snake was the symbol for Pharaoh. Right? So on Pharaoh's headdress, uh, there was the symbol of, of this snake. Um, you see, the, the point is that God can turn a piece of wood into the animal that represents Pharaoh. God created Pharaoh, right? And, and just as Moses was holding this serpent in his hand, God is holding Pharaoh in his hand. See, God is in control. It, it's as if God is saying to Moses, Moses, I created Pharaoh. I lifted him up, and I can, I can bring him down. I, I'm in charge. Okay? So, so that, that's, I think, the meaning of the first miracle. But here's the second one, the second show of power. And it's um, God turning Moses' hand leprous and then restoring him. Verse 6. Again the Lord said to Moses, Put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, Put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the, the latter side. Now, now this one is, is somewhat obvious. It doesn't require too much explanation, but this signifies God's power over sickness and, and, and death, right? That, that God is the one who, who restores people to health. For a person in these days to be struck with, with leprosy was to be unclean and unfit to come into the presence of God. And it's God alone 
who is able to make people fit for his presence. Leprosy was seen as a, a judgment uh, from God. And the point is that God is telling Moses, Moses, I have the, the power, I have the ability um, to make people whole again. Um, so let, let's look now at the third, the third display of, of God's power. That is turning the waters of the Nile into, into blood. Um, the text continues, um, If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Now I want you to notice that God doesn't actually do this because Moses is nowhere near the Nile. He, he's out in the wilderness. He, he's he's in, in, in Midian. Um, uh, near near uh, Mount Sinai. Um, but God promises that he will do it. So think for a moment. It, it, isn't it highly plausible that Moses is thinking, wait, okay. So you're going to stand before the Pharaoh, right? And, and, and to prove to him that you really sent me, you want me to scoop up a cup full of water out of the Nile. And, and when I look at it, it's, it's water. But then when I pour it out and it hits the ground, it's going to turn to blood. So this is like a true act of faith. Because can you imagine if he scooped it up and poured it out and it was just water? And he's like, okay, just kidding. Hang on, maybe God said do it twice and then it will, right? So, so Moses no doubt has some, some, some nervousness um, uh, about this. But, but he actually has to, has to trust. Um, so God has shown Moses the, these three miracles that will convince Pharaoh and convince the children of Israel that God really sent Moses and called him out of the the burning bush. And so Moses, don't you know, at this point, he's like desperate, you know, because God said, I'm going to enable you to have divine, miraculous power to perform these three signs. See, God is removing all of Moses' objections. He's dealt with them. He's handled them. Moses, now it's time for you to obey. It's time for you to obey. And no doubt Moses is, like the panic is rising. And, and so what's his next, his next um, objection in verse 10? Moses says to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Now, think about this for a second. The message that God told Moses to take to Pharaoh doesn't require eloquence. You don't have to be eloquent at all to pass this message along. Four words. Let my people go. Right? Moses, you can write that on a note card, a little three by five. You see, Moses, he's just desperate, and, he, and he's making, making these excuses. Now, Moses' excuse that he can't go to Pharaoh um, because he's not eloquent, it's not as bad as one of my children's excuses, but it, it's close. So we had a, a, um, a child who, a couple of years ago, who we loved very dearly, um, and he was in, in a habit for only a few days where we would tell him to do something. We would say, hey, buddy, go do this. And he would say, I can't. And we would say, uh, why can't you? And he would look at us and say, because it's raining. And we would look at the, the blue sky, not a cloud in the sky, and say, pal, it's not raining, and go do it right now. Okay, so that was his sort of made-up excuse. Now, Moses is not um, being quite that lame, but, um, but it's pretty close. So how does God respond? How does God respond to, to Moses? Verse 11. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. I, I mean, is this verse not just an unbelievable statement that God is in charge of everything? That absolutely nothing is apart from his will, no matter how bad, no matter how difficult, no matter how trying it is. There is nothing that falls outside the scope of God's wisdom. Even these hardships and handicaps that some people are struck with, that don't ever say that, that when something bad happens, well, that was the devil. You know, that wasn't the, the will of God that, that that happens. How can we say that on the basis of of verses like 11. But, but God's central response to Moses is he says, I will give you the words to speak. I, he says, literally, I will be with your mouth. I will give you the words to speak. Um, 
you know, one of the themes of the New Testament is that, is that Jesus is greater than Moses, right? And that comes out again and again, especially in the book of, of Hebrews. And it's fascinating that Jesus said something very, very similar um, to what Moses is saying um, in Luke chapter 12, 11 to 12. Let me read those verses. That Jesus says to, to his, his disciples, And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And it's the very same thing here that, that God reveals to, to Moses. He says, Moses, if, if you step forward in faith, you can be confident that I will not let you down. I will assist you. I will help you. I will give you the wisdom. I will give you the words in that hour. And so Moses, he's out of excuses, and he finally tells the truth in verse 13. Moses said, oh, my Lord, please send somebody else. What's he, what's he saying? I don't want to go. I, I'm, I'm scared. I'm, I, 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 I don't want to do it. Please, let somebody else. Uh, uh, one commentator writes, writes these words that I think are, are very um, on the mark. After four carefully reasoned objections, Moses finally admits the truth. He just doesn't want this dangerous, arduous, all-consuming mission that will completely change his life. He's like the child who gives a dozen reasons to explain why he cannot do his homework and then finally gets to the truth. I just don't want to do it. This fifth objection is a final, desperate plea. Moses, I mean, he says, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't want to. Even, even with you, even with the promise of your presence, I, I need something else. Uh, I'm too scared. Now, at this point, God could have, like, zapped Moses, right? Like, you wicked servant. You know, I've, I've even given you the power to, to perform miracles, and, and yet you, you refuse to, to heed me. You refuse to obey me. But you know what's so interesting? Moses does, does God does this with Moses, but he also does it with us. It's as if God condescends and says, look, if that's what you need, then I will give you help. And in this case, he says, I'm going to give you a helper. Verse 14. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming up to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in heart. Now, um, remember, keep in mind, Moses has not seen his brother in all likelihood in a generation. It's been at least 40 years since he's, um, he's seen Aaron, but, but there, there will be a reunion soon. And then the last section up here reads as follows. God says, You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. His mouth it will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him, to Aaron. And take in your hand the staff with which you shall do the signs. What does God promise Moses? But what he does is he promises him a faithful brother. And, and that's literal brother because he is his brother. But he promises Moses, um, I will send you, not alone, but I will send you with a faithful friend. I, I really think that this is God condescending, in a sense, to, to Moses' weakness and his lack of faith. But you, you know what? It, isn't this also true um, about our human nature? I mean, come on. Those of us, even if we've been Christians for a long time, sometimes it's as if God's promises are, are, are not, they're not enough. And we actually need someone. You know, we, we need a friend. We need someone to walk alongside of us um, in the Christian life, especially if we're doing things that, um, that require courage. Um, and, and I want to just ask you this question. Do you have at least one faithful Christian friend like that? One person that, that you can reach out to when, when you're struggling or, or when you know that God has called you to, to something great or even to something ordinary, but, but you're fearful, right? Are there others that, that look to you like that? Folks, that, that is not an ungodly thing. It is a perfectly godly thing for us to seek men and women who, um, uh, who, who can be that uh, for us, who can be that sort of a friend, um, so that we, we're, we're um, encouraged and challenged to live a life of, of mission. I mean, that is what God calls us to. God is calling Moses out on this mission, right? And, and God has done that with each of his children as well. We are called out on mission. Uh, now, I, I want to clarify that word because a lot of people, when they hear mission, they think missions, as in like foreign missions. Now, that is um, an absolutely legitimate 
a way of understanding the, the, the scriptures that God does call us to take the gospel to all nations, not just here, but, but abroad. But uh, I'm using the word mission in a different sense, and it's that God has given, um, he has placed upon all of us um, a calling in our lives to make an impact for him wherever we go, right? So it's not just in the foreign fields that he's called us to. He has, he has called you to, to serve a, a mission for him in your place of work, right? It could be inside the home. Maybe you're, you're a parent who, who spends a lot of time with your children. Well, that, that, that might be your, your, your mission uh, locally. Um, but wherever, wherever God takes us, he calls us to live a life of, of mission. If it's where we, where we play, where we live, where we, where we work, um, we need to have that, that mindset um, going forward. I am I'm convinced. You know, um, it's easy to write Moses off as faithless. I mean, it's easy to, to just kind of be judgmental as we read this story and say, like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, you saw the miracles right there. I mean, he did them right in front of you. You know, your hand leprous and the staff turning into a snake, and yet you still refuse to believe God? Um, do we really think that we would do better than Moses? I, I know that I would. I know that I would be fearful uh, if I were in his, um, his exact type, type of situation. Um, do you notice your hesitation to, to speak on, on the Lord's behalf? Uh, just as Moses had great hesitation to, to speak on, on the Lord's behalf. Um, what opportunities do, do, do we as a church have to, to, to tell people about the Lord? I see this, uh, this coronavirus, this threat, as an unbelievable opportunity for, for the children of God. That, that we have an opportunity now, uh, when things are difficult, you know, to, to be able to speak with others about the hope that we have within us. That's what 1 Peter chapter 3 says, that we're to always be ready to give a defense um, to, 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 to those who don't know God, um, and to do that with gentleness um, and with fear. So I, I see this as an opportunity um, for us to tell people about the Lord. But let me ask a question. Is there really any difference in the way that a follower of Jesus um, should respond to the coronavirus uh, between that and, and how someone who doesn't know Christ should respond to the, to the coronavirus? I, I hope so. And, and if there's not, if, if we're just as freaked out as everybody, like, like there's a problem with that. And, and God calls us to faith. He calls us to, um, to, to a deeper trust um, in Him. So maybe see this as something we need to be very careful of. But it's also something that, uh, that, that God might use as an opportunity so that we can show ourselves different. Now, now different, hear me, different doesn't mean, well, we should just flout the CDC's recommendations, right? Like, that's just stupid, okay? But, like, that, that's, not what God, that's not what God wants us to do. We need to wash our hands. So maybe it's like we have an ability to show others our trust in God as we cover our mouths when we cough. Right? We can do two things at once, right? We don't have to just do one thing. Um, I think it's wisdom for us to do both. But you know what? Let's take it to just the worst imaginable um, uh, scenario. Like if, if, if people just by the thousands in the United States and in our community start, um, start, start dying, um, a believer has nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. Our lives are in the hands of of a wise and a powerful God. And, and that's why the Apostle Paul, um, he wrote these words in Romans 14, 8. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So then whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. You know, the, the greatest threat um, in the world right now is not coronavirus. That's not the greatest threat. The worst thing that happens if you get the coronavirus is you die. The, the greatest threat in the world right now is, is sin. See, because if you die in your sins, you have to stand before a righteous God and, and give an account for your life. And, and I think that, that this is an opportunity, as, as I say, for us to be able to share the good news about the hope that we have within us. See, God, God promised... Um, power to, to Moses, right, through, through these, these signs. He, he gave Moses promises through his words, and he also gave him a power. 
I had to have the three Ds, right? A, a pal, a, a friend, and, and that was that was uh, Aaron, of course, to accompany him. But you know what I realized is, is we also get all three of these things through the Son of God, through Jesus Christ. That is, in Christ, the power of God is available to you and to me. Um, in, in Christ, we have the living promises of God. And in Jesus Christ, we have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. One who loves us so much that he died for us. It was Jesus who, several thousand years later, would say, greater love has no man than this, than that he lays down his life for his friends. And how ironic that the one who spoke those words, within a few weeks, would stretch out his arms on the cross and give his life for his people. And, and so I call you now, church, scattered church, we might call you this morning, to, um, to repentance and, and faith. That if, like me, you are cut to the heart when you read Exodus 4. Because you know that in yourself, uh, there is the lack of faith. There is a reluctance to speak to others on, on behalf of, of God. Um, we can repent from that. We can say, God, God I'm, I'm sorry for this, this unhealthy fear that I've had. And, and God, will you please enable me as I look to, as I look to you, Jesus. Would you enable me to, uh, to be the witness that you've called me in this difficult situation? Will you please uh, uh, pray with me and we'll, we'll close. Father, we know that you are the God of all. You are the God of um, sickness. You are the God of health. You are the God of life. You are the God of death. There is nothing that happens uh, apart from or outside of your kind, um, your, your good, loving will. And I pray, Lord, that we as a church would be mobilized, even as we are separated um, this Sunday, we would be mobilized to show others that there really is a difference in knowing you and in following you, uh, not when things are good, because that's super easy, but when things are, uh, when things are difficult and when fear is widespread. I pray that you would enable us to do this, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.